the Chicago Theater of the Air. Produced and narrated by Marion Clare, conducted by Henry Weber, written and directed by Jack LaFrandre, the Mutual Broadcasting System presents from coast to coast the Chicago Theater of the Air, radio's greatest hour of music and drama. Tonight, we're going to visit the unique world of Gilbert and Sullivan through the music and madness of the gondoliers, a merry satire aimed at Italy, Spain, and the mythical island of Barataria. Our stars include Anja Cusack, John Carter, Ruth Slater, John Barclay, Bruce Foote, and Earl Wilkie, supported by an all-Chicago dramatic cast and the chorus under the direction of Robert Trendler. Ladies and gentlemen, before giving over our stage to a make-believe world of music and song, may we dwell for a moment on our world as it is and think of what the doctrines of these United States of America mean to us as Americans and what these doctrines mean to millions of people in foreign lands who have hitched their hopes and ideals to our star of self-government, equal opportunity, and human tolerance. Just 86 years ago tonight, our American creed, the basic principles upon which our republic was founded, was documented in simple, beautiful, inspired language by a tall, gaunt man who stood with bowed head on the historic battlefield at Gettysburg. Thus, it is significantly appropriate tonight that we commemorate this anniversary of that sacred hour through the voice of Colonel Robert R. McCormick, outspoken American patriot, noted world historian, distinguished editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune, and featured speaker of this broadcast series. Colonel McCormick's commemoration will be followed by a group of songs from the hearts of our forefathers, Civil War songs, songs that real Americans will never forget. Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Robert R. McCormick. In these days, when so much treason is being uncovered in our government, and where more sedition than patriotism is found in our college teaching and in our school books, it is essential that the three great documents explaining our institutions should be stated and restated till everyone knows them. These documents are Patrick Henry's famous speech telling why the Revolutionary War must be fought, Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence stating the God-given rights of man, and Abraham Lincoln's reaffirmation of them in his Gettysburg Address. These three great instruments will be repeated by me every year as long as I'm on the air. Tonight I will read the Gettysburg Address, delivered 86 years ago today. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We've come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, no long remember what we say here but it can never forget what they did here. 
It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we may take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Tonight. 
Commemorating its 86th anniversary, Colonel Robert R. McCormick, editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune, has presented Abraham Lincoln's inspired Gettysburg Address. The Chicago Theater of the Air soloists, chorus, and orchestra joined with Colonel McCormick in this significant commemoration. Free copies of the Gettysburg Address, one of the greatest of all American documents, may be obtained by writing to the Mutual Broadcasting System, Chicago 11, Illinois. Now, ladies and gentlemen, our stage is given over to the light-hearted world of Gilbert and Sullivan and tonight's Chicago Theater of the Air production of The Gondoliers. Our stars, Anja Cusack, John Carter, Ruth Slater, John Barclay, Bruce Foote, and Earl Wilkie. Our conductor, Henry Weber, and our narrator, Marion Clare. The Chicago Theater of the Air presents The Gondoliers by W.S. Gilbert and Sir Arthur Sullivan. <laughs> and radio, we find ourselves in dreamy Venice, a rotogravure sort of Venice, with gondolas gliding along the blue canals, neath a paper mache moon in a velveteen sky. Standing before the palace of the Grand Inquisitor is a group of most attractive young maidens, their arms laden with flowers, their eyes watching the arrival of each gondola with great expectancy. Judging from these exclamations of delight, it is obvious that the awaited gondola has arrived. Out of this gondola step two dashing gondoliers, Marco and Giuseppe Palmieri by name. The purpose of their visit is to choose two brides from among the fair candidates awaiting them. For the merriest fellows are we. and laughing and quipping and quaffing we're happy as happy can be with loving and laughing and quipping and quaffing we're happy as happy can be Three cheers! And three cheers, too, for 
for the gondoliers. Tell us, maids, for whom prepare ye these floral tributes extraordinary? For Giuseppe and Marco Palmieri, the pink and flower of the gondolieri. Giuseppe, my brother, the girls rejoice. Our brother Marco, they await our choice. <laughs> our brides. As all are young and fair and amiable besides, we really do not care a preference to declare. Oh, no preference. These handkerchiefs upon our eyes be good enough to bind. And take good care that both of us are absolutely blind. All right. There. And there. Now, turn us round and we, with all convenient dispatch, will undertake to marry any two of you we can. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, <laughs> I've at last achieved a capture. Marco's caught me, oh, rapture, rapture. And Tessa here belongs to me. Oh, Giuseppe, such sweet reverie. Viva, Viva Tessa! Tessa! Viva Giuseppe! Thank you. 
Spanish flavor is added to this spicy tale as a rather pretentious gondola stops before the Grand Inquisitor's palace and discharges a very ragged but quite regal entourage. Behold, the Duke and Duchess of Plaza Toro, the lovely daughter Casilda, and a menial named Louis, who carries, of all things, a drum. Ah, the plot thickens. From the sunny Spanish shore, the Duke of Plaza Toro, and his grace is such a true. And his grace is also too. And his grace is private drummer to Venetia shores have come. To Venetia shores have come. And his grace is to Spain. Neither that grandee from the Spanish shore. The noble Duke of Plaza Tor. Nor no, his grace is such a staunch and true. You may add his grace is daughter too. Nor his grace is own particular drummer to Venetia shores have come. To Venetia shores have come. If ever, ever, ever they get back to Spain, they will never, never, never come to see again. They will never, 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 never,
When told that they would all be shot unless they left the service, that hero hesitated not, so marvelous his nerve is. He sent his resignation in the first of all his coro, that very knowing, overflowing, easygoing paradigm, Duke of Plaza Toro. To men of Plaza Clema, he always showed the way, that very knowing, overflowing, easygoing paradigm, the Duke of Plaza Toro. Cassilda, Cassilda. Oh, Louis, you shouldn't have followed me into the garden. We might be seen. Never fear. Your father and mother have audience with the Grand Inquisitor. We are quite alone. Kiss me, Cassilda. Oh, Louis. This must be our last embrace. What? I have just learned to my surprise and indignation that I was wed in babyhood to the King of Barataria. Married as a baby? Wasn't that rather rushing into things? To think that less than ten minutes ago, we belonged to each other, Louis. Somehow, oh, is me. It was no crime. Casilda, let us dwell in the past. There was a time, a time forever gone. Oh, woe is me. It was no crime to love but thee alone. Oh, woe is me. One heart, one life, one soul, one aim, one goal. in the other's throne, each all in all, ah, woe is me, ah, woe is me. Oh, Barry, they let the great close all the days that was that never will be.
here you are, my child. Oh, yes, Father. I, I was just admiring the garden. And my daughter, allow me to present to you his distinction, Don Alhambra Bolero, the Grand Inquisitor. So this is the little lady so unexpectedly called upon to assume the functions of royalty, huh? Hmm, firm a figure, is she not? Firm, indeed. Hmm. Hmm, hmm. Your distinction. Such keen powers of observation would qualify you as Lord High Hosiery Inspector of Venice. Thank you, my dear. I shall take that office under serious consideration at my next meeting with myself. Unfortunately, Casilda, there appears to be some little doubt as to your husband's, uh, I mean, his majesty's whereabouts. A doubt, mother? Then I may yet be saved? A doubt? Oh, dear, no. In the entire annals of our history, there is absolutely no circumstance so entirely free from all manner of doubt of any kind whatever. <laughs> Stole the prince and I brought him here And left him gaily prattling With a highly respectable gondolier Who promised the royal babe to rear And teach him the trade of a time when near With his own beloved prattling Both of the babes were strong and stout And considering all things clever Of that there is no matter of doubt No probable possible shadow of doubt No possible doubt whatever No possible doubt whatever Time sped, and when at the end of a year I sought that infant cherished, that highly respectable gondolier was lying a corpse on his humble bier. I dropped the grand inquisitor's tear. That gondolier had perished. A taste for drink combined with gout had doubled him up forever. Of that there is no manner of doubt, no probable possible shadow of doubt, no possible doubt whatever. No possible doubt whatever. The children followed his old career. This statement can't be parried. Of a highly respectable gondolier. Well, one of the two who will soon be here. But which of the two is not quite clear? Is the royal prince you married? Search in and out and round about, and you'll discover never a tale so free from every doubt. All probable possible shadow of doubt. All possible doubt, whatever. A tale so free from every doubt. Your distinction. Do you mean to say that I am married to one of the two gondoliers, but that it is impossible to say which? Without any doubt of any kind, whatever. It is definitely either Marco or Giuseppe Pamieri. The nurse to whom your husband was entrusted is at present living far off in the mountains. I have sent for her, and if she finds any difficulty in making identification, perhaps the torture chamber will jog her memory. What a perfectly delightful state of utmost confusion for a bride to be in. the gondoliers. A double marriage ceremony has just been performed. 
Marco and Giuseppe Palmieri have taken as bride the lovely maidens Tessa and Janetta, and there are great plans for the future. When a merry maiden Mary, far of gold and pleasure tarry, every sound becomes a song, all is right and nothing wrong. From today and never after, let our tears be tears of laughter, every sigh that finds a bed. Greetings, good people. Festivities of some sort going on, I perceive. That's correct. A little family gathering. Uh, somebody's birthday. Yes, it's mine. And mine. And mine. And mine. Curious coincidence. How old are you? Ten minutes. Hmm. How quickly you age. We were married about ten minutes ago. You're... What? All of you? All four of us. Well, bless my heart. How extremely awkward. And now, my good man, oh. if your curiosity is satisfied, run along. Oh, my back. How dare you call me your good man. Sirs, I am his distinction, the Grand Inquisitor, Don Alhambra Bolero. Oh. oh. I am here to inform you that one of you, I know not which, is no less a personage than the King of Barataria. What? Yes. And I trust the King is one of you who slapped me on the back and called me his man. One of us a king? And one of us a queen. As the island of Barataria is in a state of insurrection, it is necessary for you to assume the reins of government at once. And until it is ascertained which of you is the rightful king, I have arranged for you to reign jointly so that no question can arise hereafter as to the validity of any of your acts. Oh, how wonderful. Well, the sooner we're off, the better. I'll run home and pack a few things at once. Oh, no, 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 that won't do at all. We can't have any ladies. What? what? It does seem awkward, but you must leave your wives at home until the rightful queen has been, I mean, for a few months. After all, what's a few months? But we've only been married for half an hour. <laughs> Do not give way to this uncalled for grief. 
your separation will be very brief. To ascertain which is the king and which the other, I'll bring to Barataria's court his foster mother. Her former nursling to declare she'll be delighted. That settled, let each happy pair be reunited. <laughs> Vivace, we leave Venice and skip across the sea to the court of Barataria. The gondoliers, Marco and Giuseppe, are seated on twin thrones, perfectly magnificently attired, engaged in cleaning their crowns and scepters. As his distinction, the Grand Inquisitor, approaches, a pair of frowns may be perceived, enveloping their cherubic countenances. My word, such splendid examples. Perfect specimens of monopoly magnificence. My dear Inquisitor, we are reasonably content. But there is one little grievance that we should like to ventilate. Uh, ventilate? Air, that is. A grievance? It is all very well for us to act as one individual. But we have two independent appetites, and the court supplies us with but a single ration. Hmm, an exacting point. But remember, one of you is a commoner and not entitled to eat. Yes, but what, until it is established as to which one of us is commoner than the other, can't some nutritional arrangement be made? Mm, I think you may take double rations as long as you post bonds. But of course, you must work hard to justify the extra sustenance. That seems quite reasonable, Marco. Oh, very reasonable. The least we can do is to make ourselves useful about the palace. Rising early in the morning, we proceed to light the fire. Then a majesty adorning in its work and day attire, we embark without delay on the duties of the day. First, we polish off some batches of political dispatches and foreign politicians circumvent. Then, if business isn't heavy, we may hold a royal levy or ratify some acts of parliament. Then, we probably reuse the hollow troops with the usual shallow humps and shallow hoops. Or receive a ceremonial and state an interesting Eastern potentate. After that, we generally go and dress a private valley. It's a rather nervous duty. He's a touchy little man. Write some letters literary for our private secretary. He is shaky in his spelling, so we help him if we can. Then in view of cravings enter, we go down and order dinner. Then we polish the regalia and the coronation plate. Spend an hour into debating all our gentlemen in waiting. Or we run on little errands for the minister of state. Oh! Philosophers may sing of the troubles of a king, yet the duties are delightful and the privilege is great. But the privilege and pleasure that we treasure beyond measure is to run on little errands for the ministers of state. Oh, philosophers may sing of the troubles of a king, yet the duties are delightful and the privilege is great. But the privilege and pleasure that we treasure beyond measure is to run on little errands for the ministers of state. Oh, 
It was quite considerate of the Inquisitor to arrange for double rations, was it not? Quite considerate. Now, if only our wives were with us, our happiness could be quite complete. Take a pair of sparkling eyes hidden ever and anon in a merciful eclipse. Do not heed their mild surprise, having passed the ruby come, take a pair of rosy lips. Take a pig and trimly bland, such as admiration wept, be particular in this. Take a tender little hand, fringed with dainty fingerets, press it, press it. In parentheses, oh, take all these, you lucky man. Take and keep them if you can, if you can. Take all these, you lucky man. Take and keep them if you can, if you can. Take my counsel, happy man. Act upon it if you can, if you can, if you can. Act upon it if you can, happy man. Marco, the fates have heard us, our wives. Janetta. Marco. Tessa. Giuseppe. Oh, this is indeed a delightful surprise. We thought you'd like it. After you left, we felt very dull and mopey, and the days crawled by, and you never wrote. So at last I said to Janetta, I can't stand this any longer. Those two poor monarchs haven't got anyone to mend their stockings or sew on their buttons or patch their clothes. At least I hope they haven't. So let's pack up and see how they're getting on. And she said done, and all the girls said done. We asked old Jacopo to lend us his boat, and he said done. We crossed the sea, and thank goodness that's done, and here we are, and I've done. <laughs> and now, which of you is king? And which of us is queen? We won't know until that nurse turns up. But the question is, how shall we celebrate our honeymoon? Will you allow us to offer you a magnificent banquet? We will. Thank you very much. And may I suggest a dance? A banquet and a dance. Oh, this is too much happiness. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Good evening, Your Majesty. Fancy ball going on? Oh, not exactly a distinction. A little friendly dance, that's all. Well, it pains me to interrupt, but His Grace, the Duke of Plaza Toro, Her Grace, the Duchess, and their beautiful daughter, Casilda, have arrived at Barataria and will be here at any moment. The Duke of Plaza Toro? How does he concern us? Ah, the daughter. The beautiful daughter. Ah, oh, you're a lucky fellow, one of you. Your distinction. I find you an extremely incomprehensible old gentleman. Allow me to attempt elucidation. Well, here, sit on my throne and have some tea and crumpets. Yes, thank you. Many years ago, when you, whichever you are, were a baby, you, whichever you are, were married to the beautiful Casilda. I congratulate you, whichever you are, with all my heart. Married when a baby? Uh... Will you pass the jam, if you please? But we were married three months ago. Hmm, gooseberry. One of you, whichever you are, is a bigamist. A oh, bigamist? Oh, dear me, your wives. This complicates matters. Do you mean to say that one of these monarchs was already married? An infant romance, you understand. Romper love. <laughs> But which of us is married to which of them, and what's to become of the other? You will not be kept long in suspense, for the old lady who nursed the royal child will soon be here to make the identification. Uh, will you pass the jam again, please? Well, it seems that two husbands have managed to acquire three wives. That's two-thirds of a husband to each wife. I hate arithmetic. Behold, behold, the Duke and Duchess of Plaza Toro and their beautiful daughter, Casilda. head in love too, Casilda, with our wives. Your wives? Then you are married? Married? My word. It's not our fault, you know. Of course not. We are sisters in misfortune. Hawky one and all, the time has come. Behold the nurse who can identify his royal highness. The infant king was once entrusted to my fond care ere I grew old and crusted. When traitors came to steal this heir reputed, another lad I substituted. The villains fell into the trap completely. I hid the king, still sleeping sweetly. He became the duke's servant with pardonable slyness. His name, Louis, his royal highness. Louis! <laughs> husband in babyhood, the king of Barataria, is my own true love. Casilda, Casilda, my own. Giuseppe, oh, Giuseppe. Ah, oh, Tessa, Tessa, my own. Marco, oh, Marco. Janetta, my own Janetta. Well, it seems that everything has ended quite satisfactorily. Of that, there can be no shadow of a doubt. No possible doubt whatever. Uh, will you pass the jam, please?
Narrated by Marion Clare, conducted by Henry Weber, written and directed by Jack LaFondre, the Chicago Theater of the Air has presented The Gondoliers by Gilbert and Sullivan, starring Anja Cusack, John Carter, Bruce Foote, Ruth Slater, John Barclay, and Earl Wilkie. Featured speaker was Colonel Robert R. McCormick. Robert Trendler was in charge of the chorus. in synchronized speaking roles tonight were Sandra Gere as Casilda, Elmira Ressler as Janetta, Muriel Bremner as Tessa, Hope Summers as the Duchess, Everett Clark as Giuseppe, Jonathan Hall as Marco, Norman Gottschalk as Louise, and Carl Crunky as the Inquisitor. This is Lee Bennett cordially inviting you to next week's Chicago Theater of the Air production, The Vagabond King, starring Nancy Carr, Thomas L. Thomas, and Gloria Lane. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.